Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Artist as Storyteller Speaker Series. Um, my name is Steph Hankinson and I'm Humanities and Drama faculty at South Seattle College. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderators for today's conversation with Seattle-based multidisciplinary artist, founding member and tattooer at Bad Apple Tattoo in Seattle, Emma Cates Shaw. But before I introduce Denise and Jules and Emma, I'd like to offer a land acknowledgement so that we can set our intention and our energy before we become too immersed in our conversation. We would like to acknowledge that the Artist as Storyteller Project is located in West Seattle, the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. Members of our team were born and raised on the traditional lands of the Suquamish, Sklalem, Chumash, Tongva, Shawnee, and Kickapoo tribes. And we would like to honor the stewardship of these indigenous peoples whose land and stories we now have the privilege of having been shaped by. Thank you. Now, a little bit about the Artist of Storyteller series for those of you who are joining us for the first time. The Artists of Storyteller series was fueled by the desire to put BIPOC artists, performers, and activists directly into conversation with students and the community to create a new space for human connection and celebrating creativity in all its forms. Our first season explores adaptation, resiliency, and environmental justice in the time of COVID-19. I'd like to welcome our student moderator, Jules Kress. Jules is a queer student from Southern California. She spent four years in the US Navy where she got her certification in cryogenics and became fluent in Russian and is now using the GI Bill to study political science. She has the experience as a queer youth advisor with the Boys and Girls Club and has worked closely with Black Lives Matter to seek justice for the wife of a black veteran who was murdered by police in 2018. Her hopes for the future are to attain equity for minority communities and improve the political climate in the US. Other hobbies include graphic design, photography, professional video editing, and spending time with her beautiful girlfriend and kitty cat. Our faculty co-moderator is Denise Kromas. Denise is a communication studies faculty member at South Seattle College. She's an alleged writer and cultural studies scholar, as well as a sometimes translator and web designer. A Jutina and first generation Chilean American with deep ancestral roots in Warsaw, Poland, Denise's work is as hybridized as her identity. A jack of many trades and master of none, all her work is driven by a deep love for the emancipatory potential of storytelling. And now I'd like to introduce our fabulous guest artist, Emma Cates Shaw. Emma Cates Shaw is a multidisciplinary artist from New York living in Seattle. Her focus when the world is up and running is mainly on tattoos, but in quarantine, she's been exploring everything from life drawing to lamp making floral arranging and curating the gallery in her home. She's a founding member and tattooer at the Bad Apple Tattoo Collective in Seattle. And Emma is fascinated and heavily influenced by naturally occurring patterns, gradients, and chaos. All of her work, tattooing included, takes into the account the importance of community and the interconnected web of human experience and the strength of trust and vulnerability. Central to Emma's work is a commitment to integrating aesthetic experiences into community living as an act of love and a critical part of building an art practice. Emma, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna to turn it over to Denise, but welcome, welcome, welcome. We're so pleased to have you here. Thank you so much, Steph, for that lovely introduction. And yes, Emma, Thank you so much for being here. And Jules, thank you so much for helping moderate and drive this discussion. Um, just to let everyone know before we begin talking, um, if questions come up for you as we're chatting, things that you wanna ask Emma, um, please use the Q&A. You can ask questions as we speak in there. And then towards the end of our discussion, Jules is gonna moderate and she'll make sure that your questions do get asked. 
Um, all right, so first off, I've been really looking forward to this conversation um, for several months. Um, I have been familiar with Emma's work for several years now. I actually um, uh, really enjoy um, looking at her Instagram and not just for the incredible tattoo work, but just for sort of the political orientation of all of her sort of living and art practice. It's um, something that when we first came up with the um, year's theme of a adaptation, resiliency, and environmental justice um, for the series, I really immediately thought of Emma and her work, um, both in its content and form, as well as how Emma has been impacted by COVID and how she's adapted. And so before we jump into our conversation, I do want to share a few images of Emma's incredible work. So I'm going to pull this up. All right, so here, right, you can see some images of um, the tattooing that Emma's done. And what I've always been struck by in Emma's work is this incredible intimacy and tension between sort of the delicate style and the subjects that Emma often chooses, particularly things that we think of as hard and inanimate like rocks, or beings that we see as threats like snake or jellyfish. And then of course, all the natural detritus from the forest and the ocean. Um, and I've just always been so compelled by these images. Um, and one thing I also love are these rock collections that um, Emma does for people. And I've actually been thinking, I collect my own uh, natural detritus and I've thought about bringing my own random collection in with me as well. And part of it is just the way it translates one's relationship to the environment in this really meaningful and intimate way as well. And something I also wanted to show was that this wasn't just true of Emma's tattoo work, but it's also true for the other work that um, she has done. Um, there's this amazing tension between the domestic versus fine art, between affirmation and resistance. Um, and so when Emma talks about bringing in art to people's daily communal living, um, uh, it, I really feel that when I look at her work. So Emma, um, now that I've been talking about you, I'm going to talk at you. So I know that you studied studio art in college. And um, I'm sort of curious, like, I want to know a little bit more about the development of your art practice in general, but also how did you get into tattoos and particularly stick and poke, which is its own sort of unique form and technique as well? Hey Denise, yeah. before Emma, sorry to interrupt. I apologize. Denise, I'm wondering if you can scroll through some of those images again. Some of them were a little obscured on the screen and I want to make sure folks can see all of that. So maybe Emma, as you address the first question, we can scroll through some of the images again. Totally. totally. Yeah. Um, I first I want to say thank you to Denise, Jules, and Steph um, for having me. I'm so excited to be in conversation with you and really appreciate the opportunity. Um, also, this is my dog, Waylon, and he may be interrupting us occasionally, um, just FYI. So yeah, I'm, I'm from New York. Um, I grew up in New York and went to school in Philadelphia. And I graduated from college, um, kind of unsure of what I was going to do and where I was going to be. Um, and the summer before I moved out to Seattle, I ended up working at a camp and this camp was really special to me. It had been special to me for my entire childhood. Um, and at the after like staff event, um, after the camp was over, um, I learned how to tattoo and it was a very spur of the moment kind of thing. Um, had a bunch of friends who all wanted tattoos, had somebody who had some supplies and had some like very basic guidance on how to do it and I ended up doing like eight tattoos um in a night and really really enjoyed myself you know they were all very much like drawn on learning tattoos nothing too complicated but I found myself really enjoying the experience and when I moved out to Seattle I kind of followed that you know enjoyment of doing that into offering tattoos to people for a meal 
offering a tattoo for help, you know, painting my room um, and just kind of building these relationships with queer community through tattooing um, as a person that was extremely new to Seattle. Um, and I moved here really without knowing anybody. So it kind of became this way that I was like making friends and building connection um, and becoming kind of enmeshed in community. And I ended up um, linking up with this person, Avery Osajima, who was also very new to hand poking. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about hand poking and why hand poking um, in a second. But I, I connected with Avery and we ended up starting a studio together. At first it was in my house <laughs> um, that I was living in, just like in a room in the house. Um, and we later got a spot in Ballard that was a little bit more professional. Um, and then both of our work kind of started to take off. And when that started happening, um, you know, up until that point, I had kind of seen myself as, okay, I'm, you know, I'm an artist. I'm definitely, I considered myself an artist, but I did not really consider myself a tattoo artist. Um, I was just like an artist that does this sometimes. Um, I was working at Second Use, which is a building material like salvage yard. Um, so I was working there full time and tattooing on my days off. I was probably working like 70 or 80 hours a week, which was pretty wild. Um, but I loved tattooing so much and I loved all these things about it. And, and I, you know, I was doing it because I loved it. Um, and when Instagram kind of flipped this switch and started showing my work to people, you know, the algorithm really started showing my work to people that I was not directly in community with and things started taking off, I kind of had this like push comes to shove moment where I realized, okay, this is a legitimate form of work. Um, it's something that people want and I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, so I made that decision, I would say probably three years ago, and I've been in Seattle almost five years. So I, I'm really, you know, COVID has totally like erased this year and also added this year to stories like this. So honestly, I am not sure <laughs> if it was like three or four years ago, but I'm pretty sure it was 2019, um, which is three years ago that I ended up joining the folks at Valentine's Tattoo, which is now um, non-existent, but I started working there kind of part-time and I went down to part-time at Second Use and then started working full-time. Um, and I am now part of a collective studio called Bad Apple, um, comprised of myself, and three other co-workers, Ursula, Albie, and Lolly, um, all of whose work you can find on the Bad Apple Tattoo Instagram page. Um, and yeah, I'm just so lucky to know and love them and work alongside them um, and be able to work in that space, which we got right before COVID started. And um, we're now just kind of getting it up and running, so. Yeah, all like have such different styles too. Like each of you yeah. is so unique down to like your content, but also just on your colorways and your lines. Um, and I'm just particularly interested in how you developed, like what drew you to Stick and Poke in particular that like spoke to you in, in your aesthetic and also like the, the, the rock collections and sort of like the straw to these patterns in nature. Like what, yeah, yeah. I just... So hand poke is just how I learned to tattoo. Um, it is extremely accessible and that's something that I really love about it. Um, it's not that it doesn't require skill, but the supplies and, you know, honing the craft, I find to be extremely accessible. So really anybody who's interested in learning how to do that can kind of order the supplies, learn some very basic, um, safety measures, which are extremely important, 
and start practicing on themselves. And you can do that with a machine, but machine work requires a lot more like tutelage and working under someone not necessarily as a rule, but you just, there's, there's a lot, you know, I don't actually really know that much about it, <laughs> but I listen to my shopmates talk, talk shop and I'm like, what are you saying? Um, <laughs> you know, certain machines run at certain speeds and are good for this or that or something else. And um, hand poking is really more just like, it's whoever's hand is doing the work. It's up to you to create, you know, a style, a way of line making, a way of mark making, shading, all of that is like very much under your control. Um, so that's why I love stuck with hand poking. It's why I love it. Um, and yeah, as I kind of, you know, when I first started working and I can, I can see this when I look back in my, um, you know, tattoo, my feed on my tattoo Instagram, I was saying yes to a lot of different projects. I was just kind of saying yes to anything that I felt like, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can draw that thing. I can like, you know, realistically do this tattoo. And I was kind of saying that over and over again. And I have a really hard time drawing flash for some reason, just really hard for me to draw like a sheet full of images that I want to put onto skin. So I was taking a lot of custom work and I remember I did this um, little booklet for my mom for Mother's Day that was about treasure hunting on beaches. And it was kind of like a guide to what to pick up and what to leave behind and like what makes a rock special, what makes it worth taking home, which is something that she and I have kind of been like workshopping and joking about for a long time. So I made this little illustrated book and I was posting photos of it on Instagram and I was like, hey, would people be interested in getting these as tattoos? Maybe this is flash, like maybe I'm drawing flash right now. And I got a really overwhelming response. Um, people were like, yes, absolutely. And so I drew this one flash sheet. <laughs> I've probably drawn like three or four flash sheets in my life. Um, and one of them was this, you know, sheet full of rocks and each individual one I gave a number and then I booked each one of those tattoos. Um, and that was kind of where it started, just people getting like a single single rock from that sheet. And I guess I just kind of started like drawing and arranging them in certain ways. So one of those um, images that you showed actually of the collections, the like, there's a round one with I'll bring rocks. i too, yeah. Let me go back. Yeah, so that one all the way on the left, um, the round one with the rocks at the bottom that are darker and then the ones at the top that are light, that was kind of, you know, I was drawing an actual design um, and arranging them ahead of time. And that was one of the first ones I did actually. Um, and there's a couple more like that where I would draw out, you know, a shape of rocks and arrange them all and kind of make some gradient happen or some like, you know, organizing effect. Um, and then I kind of moved on to what you see in the middle one there, which is like people bringing in objects or talking about, you know, this is what I tend to pick up when I go on walks. And this is like, these are all these small objects that are very important to me. Waylon says hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, just kind of free form doing those. So I would like you know, I think I made a stencil for that one of that middle little fur branch, but then everything else I drew on and then kind of like free handed. So I started doing that kind of work. Um, that sleeve all the way on the right is probably my favorite project I have ever done. Um, and that was done over maybe three or four sessions with this person who you know, he had a couple of objects that he brought in and we arranged those big ones. And then everything else we just like drew in and kind of like pieced together in this, in this way. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just been a really satisfying way to work. Um, I feel like it really like brings me together with people who are similar to me in that they're constantly looking down, picking things up and keeping them for some reason. 
um, which it can be hard to, you know, keep all those things around. So it's, it's a nice way of like immortalizing a little collection um, and maybe allowing people like me to kind of let go of our hoarding tendencies with tiny objects. You don't have to keep them. You can just put them right there and <laughs> call it a day. That's great. And so I think Jules had a question for you too about sort of yeah. getting into the practice. Yeah, go for it, Jules. Mm -hmm. So um, I understand that your field, obviously like most of them are very white male dominated. So what we were wondering is um, as a queer person of color, what was it like getting into it? How are you um, kind of doing now? Does it affect your clientele? What uh, what's it like, pretty much? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, leading up to learning to tattoo, I had only been tattooed twice in my life. Um, both of those times were at shops by white men, and they were less than satisfactory experiences. Um, I brought, you know, I would bring a drawing in and kind of say, hey, can somebody do this for me? And they would choose a needle that was way too big and do it like really not in the style that I was interested in, whatever. So I kind of, that was kind of my experience with tattooing leading up to learning. And I knew that that was kind of how tattooing was perceived um, and is, I know that it's how it's perceived still, but to be fully honest, when I started tattooing and, you know, kind of making it part of my work life, I have not been concerned with how cis white male culture sees me um, mm -hmm. as, as a legitimate member of community. I mean, there's definitely been some like imposter syndrome stuff um, that probably comes from a lot of that. So maybe it's like dishonest to say, I don't care and I haven't cared the whole time. Um, I think there's been a lot of imposter syndrome, you know, and especially a couple years ago when I was not really working consistently and didn't have a shop or like coworkers. Um, and, you know, I, as I was saying, I saw myself as an artist who happened to do tattoos, not a tattoo artist. And I remember the first time that a fellow tattooer called me a tattoo artist. I was getting tattooed by her and she was just like, we were just kind of talking and I was like, yeah, I do, I do tattoos. And she was like, so you're a tattoo artist? And I was like, well, no, I just, and she was like, you do tattoos, you're a tattoo artist. Like you work right. at a little studio, you're a tattoo artist. And so that kind of, somebody saying it to me, like helped me legitimize and feel like I was kind of getting into this identity as like, yes, I am a tattoo artist. Beyond that, I really like could not give less of a shit what cis white male tattoo culture thinks of me hand poking and making a living of yeah. it. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm not ignorant to the fact that there is a history behind tattooing and mm -hmm. this like long standing tradition. A lot of what those people are holding onto is this long standing tradition that's rooted in white supremacy and white masculinity. And that's actually not the history of tattooing. Totally. And yeah, once you learn that like very basic thing that's like indigenous peoples have been tattooing forever. They've been handled all around the world forever all around the world it's like this beautiful it's like language you know there's mm -hmm. there's so much and so like rich of a history around it that has nothing to do with white dudes working in mm -hmm. you know shops that are owned by white dudes and populated by white dudes you know just like there's that's that's its own thing I don't care about it that much. Um, and I, yeah, at this point, I feel like tattooing, especially the world that I am in, is so separate from that. Um, and again, I'm not ignorant of the, of the history behind all of that and what it means for me to be a tattooer that is not a cis yeah. dude. Um, do, you, 
do you think that in the U.S. at least it's becoming a bit more inclusive of Absolutely. all skin tones? I mean, skin tones is a whole other uh, can of worms, which we can totally talk about. There's still a lot of modern tattooers that are completely ignorant about what it means mm -hmm. to tattoo melanated skin. Um, but in terms of, you know, people who are seeking a tattoo experience that's not just walk into shop, ask white dude for what you want, get it on your body. Um, I do feel like it's getting a lot easier to um, seek that out and find these pockets of, you know, groups of people like myself and my shopmates who are working in this different way and creating space that, you know, I think part of that difference is like, what does it feel like to walk into a tattoo shop as a marginalized person and like immediately get the vibe that like, this is for me, I'm going to be taken care of here or not get that vibe. Um, right. And so we really are, you know, seeking to make our studio a space where you can walk in as a queer person, as a fat person, as a black person, as a disabled person, like any kind of marginalized identity that might walk into a traditional shop, I feel like this is really not for me, um, would walk into our shop and, and immediately know that that was not the case. So, yeah, I can say as somebody who's been getting tattoos since 1998, right? Like, I think I spent the majority of my experience having to be that, like, you know, young woman of color going into the shop in Akron, Ohio, to white dude, having to trust. I have some really funny stories from it, <laughs> but also not funny stories. Um, feeling always incredibly uncomfortable. And then also like, um, you know, I've stopped feeling like I'm going to pass out from getting tattoos. Like as soon as I started getting tattoos from queer women, women of color, for me also like it, you know, are non-binary, like, um, and a lot of it too, I know I've got tattoos that I got from people because I was afraid to say no, you know what I mean? Like I took some artwork in, I was like, can you make this come to life? And they did it, but I didn't know how to say no. And I feel like I can, that level of trust is so important. And also just the sheer artistry coming out of, um, places like Bad Apple, like the work that you and your, like, uh, fellow artists do I'm actually getting flash now which I never did before because the art is just so beautiful and I just sort of also want to mark the moment you know and sort of say like this is what was happening in this era of like this incredible art making um so as a customer I am so glad that you've made spaces like Fat Apple it's super meaningful yeah and and that you know has been central to my journey of tattooing. I remember when Avery and I started our studio, one of the biggest things that we were talking about was like, there's this machismo in tattooing that's like, it should hurt and you should be uncomfortable and you should sit through it and like not cry or express anxiety or express like anything, giddiness. You shouldn't express anything other than like, yeah, thank you. And then you go, you know? And so kind of centering this other experience of putting something on your body permanently that's that's like so much more about trust and intimacy and you know the exchange between tattooer and person being tattooed is like to me it's like gift giving it's this really really special relationship um that I feel honored to engage in every single time that I do it. And it's it's really sacred to me in that way. And it, it feels like, yeah, there's a lot more folks who are interested in engaging in that way um, now than there were maybe 10 years ago. But also, you know, underground tattooing has been happening for a long time and, and othered tattooing has been happening for a long time, so. I also want to say like, thank you to, um, you know, DIY kind of punk spaces and um, yeah, underground tattoo culture that's existed for a really long time and is just now kind of getting its moment in the sun. Yeah, totally. 
Um, so one of the themes of this year, right, is um, this idea of adaptation and resiliency. And that was definitely on purpose because a lot of people, especially when it comes to their artwork, have been forced to adapt to very different circumstances. And so I know for you as a tattooer, like your life got shut down, right? You couldn't tattoo. Like, what was that like? How did you adapt? Were you resilient? Did you adapt? Like, what have you done like this past year? Yeah. So, I mean, prior to tattooing, I'm going to be honest, like I, I considered myself an artist, but I had a really hard time sticking with one medium. And I kind of saw that as like a delegitimizing thing. I was almost like, yeah, I'm an artist, but like, I can't, I can't decide what I want to do. And tattooing was really the first thing to catch my attention and be like, I want to do this. I want to get better at it. I want to get really, really good at it actually. And like, spend all this time doing it with my life. Um, so when that went away, I was kind of left with this instinct and desire to have an art practice that I didn't even have when I was in college working on a thesis. Like, you know, I was, I was doing art all the time, but it was because I felt like I had to. And I found that when COVID hit, and I was like, okay, I'm not tattooing. I will not be tattooing for who knows how long. Um, I had this art practice muscle in me that wanted to still be flexed and wanted to like be expressed. Um, so I have really enjoyed the way that that's kind of um, happened for me. It's been a really incredible experience to set up a home studio and just kind of play um, and I've had, you know, so many different in instincts and like desires that I've just been able to be like, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dedicate a week or two weeks or three months or whatever to like learning how to do this and putting love into it in this way. Um, so I've done that with figure drawing. Um, there's this incredible person, Alex Schmidt, who does an online figure drawing class and it's, you know. And I'm also gonna share um, oh, yeah, totally. some of these images too. Yeah, as you're speaking so people can see. Um, let me click on, here we go. So yeah, I think so, what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Um, this class is open to all um, folks. I think it, it started out centered on women and non-binary and queer folks. Um, but it's called body confidence, right? It's like it's an body Instagram. confidence. Yeah. And, and she's got a website and you can just sign up to do any one of these like themed every week. There's like two themes. Um, so yeah, here's like mix Antoinette is what she calls that character with the wig. There's like a soccer character. She does feminine, which is this like playboy icon. Um, she does cowboy girl, which is like a country themed one. So super, super fun. Um, and she's an incredible model. Um, and yeah, I, you know, there were periods of time when I was doing that twice a week because that was what I was doing with my time. Um, and I do it with my mom occasionally. My mom is always asking, are you going to be in class today? Um, so that was one thing. And that was a really, really incredible, like skill building, um, practice building exercise, um, to just like have a consistent class like that. And then, yeah, you know, I started walking around my neighborhood, um, looking at all the flowers that existed on the roundabouts and in people's like yards that weren't their yards and picking stuff up and, um, also working with some neighbors who had a plot of land um, that they were growing flowers at and helping them harvest every week and arrange with flowers. And yeah, these are all just like, I was just, you know, playing around, having some fun. I took a couple classes um, and since then have just kind of like leaned on um, a few folks who do floral arranging that are friends of mine for like, tips and tricks and yeah that's been really really fun um what I love too is both the um the the floral arrangements 
and the um, body confidence work, it's still so much about building community, right? Which is sort of what grounded your tattoo practice in the first place. But it's so cool the way that you've been able to like kind of build these online communities through body confidence, right? Or body confidence is like allowing that to happen even with your mother. Mm -hmm. And then also with the um, floral arrangements too, right? Is to be able to give this practice as gift, right? And I know that, um, yeah. So I just, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and the that's what I was just about to talk about the flower arranging stuff. Um, when protests were happening over the summer and I was actually um, caring for somebody who was recovering from surgery right when all the protests were happening. So like the risk of COVID stuff meant that I was like, it wasn't super feasible for me to be out in the streets. Um, but what I ended up doing was creating kind of a hub at my um, our apartment complex, ugh, um, apartment complex hub for supplies and just kind of like collecting money, um, buying the stuff that people needed and then just like stocking it like crazy and having folks, you know, you can DM me, you can message me whenever, come by, get what you need. We're here if you need to rest in a yard, like come do that. And so my, um, my building and like the couple buildings around me, we call ourselves the Fur Trap. Um, it's a really special, super, super community-oriented living situation. And everyone was on board for that. Um, and then these flower arranging things kind of turned into this idea that was like, maybe every week we could um, be raising some money by selling flowers in order to give BIPOC folks who are experiencing stress, like, you know, very, very elevated levels of stress, um, we could give flowers and money and maybe something else to, to folks. And so we kind of created this program where, you know, white or privileged experiencing folks would pay $30 and get a bouquet. And then for we would take that money directly and just give it to someone else and give them a bouquet and like some flowers and this little like affirmation thing. Um, and that felt like a really special thing to be able to do during that period of time that was like, yes, I'm focused on like providing support for the movement that is happening right now. I'm also really, really interested in like what the opposite of policing looks like. Um, and to me, that was part of what the opposite of policing looks like. It's like building one-on-one -on -one community, you know, and one-on-one -on -one relationships with people through saying, I want to give you a gift and also, you know, directing money to the places it needs to go and, um, just supporting each other and bringing some like beauty and love into everyday life. So, yeah. Very cool. Um, so I wanted to ask you, so about a year ago, you formed the worker owned collective Bad Apple, right? Um, and, you know, there's other artists in there that are also queer and they're women. So can you tell us a little bit more about the collective and other artists um, and what it's going to be like returning to work after everything's opening up? Yeah, totally. Um, so I think to preface that, it might be important for folks to know what a traditional shop structure looks like um, and what most people getting into tattooing experience. So if you become a tattoo artist as a self-taught person, first of all, you're in the minority because most tattoo shops require you to go through a very rigorous, like, training program that looks like a mentorship. It's called an apprenticeship. Um, and it looks like a mentorship, but it also kind of looks like exploiting your labor, right? It's like you have to work for free and you have to do everybody's setups and breakdowns and you have to like go through all these trials and tribulations and hazing in some, you know, periods of time. So to kind of touch on what I was talking about before, in a white male dominated culture, that's kind of an impossible, an impossible thing for someone like me 
to think about wanting to do. I'm like, I don't want to be learning under these people. I doubt that they want to actually teach me. And even if they do, my work is going to be exploited. I'm going to be exploited in some way. And that feels really hard. So that's just kind of baseline. Um, And then in terms of the actual shop structure, it's usually like a person owns the shop and you're either like one of their employees um, and you pay into the shop a percentage of your income or you like pay a rental fee to rent a chair in a space. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was what we had all experienced before forming this collective. And so we kind of got together and started talking about what it felt like to be doing things in that way um, and paying no matter how much money we made, paying a percentage of money into a shop. Um, And we were like, we don't want to, we don't want to do that anymore. Um, yeah. Worker owned collectives are like the fucking future. So we want to do that. Um, and yeah, we, it's kind of uh, whittled, it's been whittled down to just the four of us. There were a bunch of folks involved in the beginning who moved and moved on for various reasons. Um, but yeah, we decided to find a space and figure it out, um, which ended up being right, figuring it out right before COVID. Um, And now we have this really gorgeous spot and it is all collectively owned. Um, We put an equal amount of money each into buying stuff for the shop, taking care of the shop, paying rent, all those things. And after that, we get to keep all of our money, which is really Um, amazing and allows us also to do things like you know reparations work supporting you know doing raffles and like donating funds Mm -hmm. at will um Mm -hmm. and like trying to focus on you know I need to make enough money to survive um no matter how hard I work 35 percent of it is gonna go to someone else right Yeah. yeah and I really love all the different styles that you guys have too in the shop yeah, everybody is so talented. It's really incredible. Yeah. yeah. I remember one of the biggest things that, you know, convinced me to start tattooing as my full-time job was the contrast between the feeling that I had when I was working at Second Use, which was a pretty male-dominated space, to be fair. Um, they definitely, you know, there's there were a lot of queer folks working there. Um, but I kind of felt like every day I was having to prove that I was worthy of having that job, which is like really wild. Um, and now that I look back on it, I'm like, wow, that was so stressful to every day feel like nobody here believes that I'm good enough to do this, including the customers, mostly customers who you know would come up to me and be like, are you sure you can carry that? And I'm like, I work here, this is my job. Um, So going from that, and at one point I was working there and working at a shop and tattooing. And the difference was that every day when I was tattooing, A, clients would tell me, I love this so much, thank you so much, you know, appreciate my work in that way. But also I was around other people and other tattooers that I respected the hell out of who constantly were giving, and we were just giving each other this like positive affirmation all yeah. the time. And so it felt like, okay, I'm either having to prove myself or being like really appreciated for the skills that I'm building and like the ways that I'm trying to become a professional at something. Um, and that contrast was enough to make me just be like, okay, I'm done with that one and right. I would like to do this. Um, and tattooing is such a cool profession too, because, you know, no matter how many artists exist in the world, there's that many styles and it doesn't feel Mm -hmm. like we are in competition with each other. There's so many people, I mean, there's some folks who want like, you know, a very specific kind of tattoo all over their body for their entire lives. And that's great. And, you know, but I think nowadays, and especially like in the 
scene that we find ourselves in. Um, there are folks who want to collect tattoos from so many different people and you know we're all we end up supporting each other's work and you know kind of bringing up other folks in um in tattooing in a way that feels really incredible for like an art world adjacent thing it's like we're not in competition we are like absolutely in community together and right yeah I've always felt that being around you and your and your fellow artists too, that it feels like a very communal space and it's very non-judgmental and yeah, yeah, I can, I can verify. <laughs> yeah, supportive, you know, like yeah. totally supportive rather than yeah, competitive. Hugely changing the culture and it's, yeah, yeah right? Like For things sure. that we inherit from these systems that are problematic and hurt people, yeah. Okay, well, we should get into the Q&A. Um, I'm going to read some that we've gotten, but I also have a few of my own. Um, I'm going to start with the ones we've been sent in. Um, so thank you for sharing this work with us. I'm so inspired by the textures and the mark making you mentioned. May I ask you to expand on the language of your mark making? Ooh, totally. Um, so hand po tattooing is dot by dot by dot. Um, just, you know, you have to stretch the skin and, and instead of using a machine where you're kind of like dragging and able to create a line with hand poke, it's really every single dot counts and you can build them into lines, obviously. Um, and I think for a long time, I was kind of focusing on doing that, which anytime somebody asks me, you know, how should I start learning to tattoo? I do think that the thing I would say right off the bat is like, learn to make a consistent line. Um, so it's important that I did that for a year or two and was just very focused on like, okay, I want to, you know, make clean lines, see them healed and figure that part out. Um, once I got that down and kind of as I was getting that down, I moved into this shading technique that's very similar to, it, it sounds strange, but it's similar to the way that I draw with pencil, which is like, creating a very, you know, gradual change from dark to light um, in order to like create shape, which is just drawing, but doing it in, in tattooing um, was this kind of focused thing. Um, and then I kind of moved toward, and you can see in that picture on the left, like some of those rocks are outlined and dark and the ones that are not, the, you know, mark making as it approaches a light line. So I'm thinking, I wish I could like point, <laughs> wish I could use my uh, thing, but I'm thinking like the rock that's just to the left of the little stick, the light one right above that with a big thick um, stripe in the middle. It's like a thick white stripe. Yeah, that one. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. Um, there's a really good example of where, you know, the darker parts, I, I did create a line, but right on the top there where it's approaching, where it's just that white part that's like a very gradual shadow, I didn't line it. And that is something that's like not necessarily, um, it's definitely not part of traditional tattooing in terms of mark making. Like a traditional tattoo is really focused on like, you've got to have really solid lines and then shading that looks a certain way. Um, so yeah, I just kind of started to play with that. And then, you know, you can see in the one in the middle that like mossy texture on the stick kind of employs that same mark making technique. That's like, I'm not worried about a line. Like I'm not interested in a line. I just want to make it feel like the thing. Um, Sorry, I like got so excited when you started talking about that part of the oh, tattoo okay. because it's my favorite. I'm obsessed. I collect those at my yard. <laughs> oh my God. It's just yeah. in every dot. Sorry. I'm just like freaking out because it's so good. But you go, you go. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, that's that's pretty much it. I freak out too because I'm just like, I I love, you know, texture and the variation in texture that exists in nature. And so yeah, really just like focusing on how to create that with dot making and mark making um and also employing you know use of gray wash use of like less pressure more versus more pressure and kind of what that 
does to the value of the dot. Um, and honestly, though, at this point, I just zone out and <laughs> I'm like, I'm not even thinking about what I'm doing. My hands are just like doing it. And I'm looking at the oh. object and like looking at the tattoo and just kind of like feeling it out and then it happens. Um, I'm sure people well, are to that kind of art making. <laughs> yeah. Our, our second question actually ties in pretty nicely to the previous one. Um, it said, from looking at your work, it seems that space plays a large part in your design. Is this part of your design element or more of an aspect of hand poking? So, well, I guess I can talk about space in terms of like a couple different things, but definitely negative space um, has been a really critical component, especially of the collection tattoos and just kind of reimagining what a tattoo has to be, what it looks like. Um, so it's so funny when people, you know, start getting tattooed, you can count the number of tattoos you have, right? Like I have one here and one there and one there. And I feel like with the collection tattoos, it's, it's often like I'm giving people 20 tiny tattoos that are all arranged in a, in a way that makes it actually one tattoo. Um, so yeah, I would say negative space in that way is definitely like a, a really big part of composing those. Um, and that kind of relates to this practice that I've been doing way more often now than I ever have before, which is not creating a stencil um, and working with someone's body and the, the concept of whatever tattoo we're doing to just draw something on in a very basic, you know, line-based thing, but explain to them and have them know, yeah, this is gonna look like a marker drawing, but by the time I'm done, it's gonna look like something completely different. Um, and it's going to, oh no, I um, don't have the computer plugged in. <laughs> Um, oh no, are we about to lose you? Well, it says it's going to sleep soon unless I plug it in, but I'm able to plug it in real quick. So let me just do that. Sorry, everybody. Um, I knew that I should have done it and I just totally <laughs> totally ignore me while I get it figured out. Now this, like the stick and poke makes sense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> um, Keep it simple. Keep it simple, keep it safe. Yeah, yeah. Um, here we go. I've got the charger, everything's fine. Um, you're not gonna lose me. Um, yeah, does that answer that question? I guess space is kind of a complicated, yeah. um, you know, thing to talk about. So if that wants to right. Right. elaborate a little bit, if that yeah. doesn't answer the question. Okay, um, do you have any advice for first time tattoo recipients who aren't always the best at expressing what they want slash why they want it without a little prodding? Um, and in parentheses, it says thinking about how to balance respect for the artist's time and vision while valuing the process of figuring out the art together. Yeah, totally. Um, I think there's a couple of different things I would say to that. The first thing is really choosing an artist extremely carefully if that's something that you're feeling like you know that you want something that's not just like an outline of a lightning bolt right here. Um, so yeah, I would say choosing an artist is like probably the biggest component of that. And then expressing, you know, especially if it's a first time, if, if it's your first tattoo, which I've done a lot of people's first tattoos, um, kind of expressing as much as you feel comfortable doing while also saying, you know, I would say advocate for yourself as much as you can, even if the question is like, how do I advocate for myself if I'm not good at advocating for myself? Um, I would say just like be straightforward and communicate, you know, I'm feeling anxious about this thing. I'm feeling you know, I know that I want this, but I feel open to this. Um, but I really think that choosing the right artist um, is a critical part of that. And yeah, just getting a sense, which I think you can nowadays in a lot of ways, get a sense for how the person works, what kind of work they do, you know, 
I think I'm going to also caution in another direction, which is like sometimes people come to me with an idea that is really not, it doesn't fit my style. And they'll say to me, like, I've wanted to be tattooed by you for so long because you seem like a nice person or because I really want to support, you know, a black female tattoo artist. And I want, you know, that feels important to me, which is, that's totally valid as a desire. But if it doesn't also align with like what someone's style tends to, you know, work with, then yeah, you might end up disappointed. So I would say kind of a balance between those things. Yeah. yeah. I would say too, Denise, you mentioned that you kind of said yes to a tattoo that you weren't fully happy about. So I think like a very important aspect of getting tattooed, like, you know, in my experience is like being able to say no, like you don't, it, it doesn't affect the artist at all. If, you know, you say yes to a tattoo that you're not happy with. So being able to say no and being like, actually, I'm sorry, can we tweak this a bit? I don't want it that big, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, just being able to express yourself so that you come out happy with what you want is, yeah. is a big part. And I would say kind of a balance between that and also trust, like yeah. being able to, you know, knowing that you're in a space to trust an artist whose work you admire, whose work you feel really confident in, because right. we can also feel when somebody doesn't trust us and mm -hmm. it's like nitpicking a tattoo down to like teeny, 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 tiny details. It's like, right. that actually is going it might get you closer to what you think you want, but it might not get you a tattoo that is an artist's best work. So I would say like my best work comes when I can feel that somebody trusts me and is down to like, let me do my thing up to a certain point. Um, right. So kind yeah, of you communicating, you know, where it is, where the balance is between those two right. things. Right, absolutely. I'm a this is what a treat, what a delight. I, I've been, you know, I've been sitting here just soaking all of this in and I know that I'm sure we have people in the audience that are interested in um, following your work and when things are opening up, like where can they look for ways to connect with you? Is Instagram the best place to follow you? Yeah, Instagram, um, my Instagram is thorn pokes, thorn underscore pokes. And then bad apple tattoo is my tattoo collective. Great. And so we'll post all of that on our uh, Artist and Storyteller um, website with Emma's information and all the all the stuff from the talk today. And so folks, if you're interested in connecting with Emma, that's the best way to do it and to follow her work in its um, in the full scope of what that looks like, too. I, I've just been so impressed by how you translate your form of expression and like your relationship to materials and the world around you through these different forms. It's been so, so cool to hear you share that um, as well as your political and social commitments today. So what a treat. Um, we're, we're running up against time here, but I want to, uh, I just want to thank you so much and um, invite folks to continue joining our conversations. We're, um, we're continuing through June and our next session um, with another artist is on May 31st uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. And we'll be talking with Ben Don. And uh, Ben Don is a photographer and a professor uh, in California currently. And uh, we'll talk with Ben Don about creating images that relate to history's identity and place as a sort of nexus. And we'll be exploring Don's photographic process and other investigative practices about memory and the trauma of diasporic experiences. So you can check out our website for more information about that, the Zoom link, links to uh, the Ben Don conversation, and, and then of course, um, the opportunity to watch videos from our, our earlier conversations this uh, season with artists. And soon uh, Emma's will be up and definitely to connect with Emma, all of that, uh, all those links will be online. But Emma, what a delight, what a treat. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for having me. It was really a pleasure. Thank you so much, Emma. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Jules. Thank you. Thank you. And awesome. thanks to Waylon. I mean, really. Waylon. Yeah, the real MVP over here. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, y'all are awesome. Have a great day, folks. Thanks for coming and tuning in.